doing or, or saying or living, you know, a way that, that we just don't, don't agree with for whatever reason, or, you know, they're unlovable for that matter. You know, their behavior, their actions, everything they say or do is just, how do you, how do, you do that? It's a difficult thing for us to do as Christians, but yet Jesus right, talks to disciples here concerning what that is. Right? And he goes on to say, to start off with in, in, in the scripture, uh, and it's obvious, it's interesting where the scripture is set to start off with. You know, it's, it's prior, you know, to uh, him being declared. Of course, that process was already working here at, at this point in scripture. Uh, Judas is nowhere to be found, and that's where you find the, the, the first part of the scripture, when he had gone out. Okay, so Judas is not there. He's gone out, and then we all know what, what he's doing at this point, right? Uh, he's out setting Jesus up for betrayal, already betrayed him, if you will. And uh, then Jesus goes on to say, the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. So he understands what's about to happen with the disciples. He understands the turmoil that they're about, they're about to face. And so he's, 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 he's trying to set them up, right, and prepare them for that turmoil. And he tells them, you know, the Son of Man has been glorified. God has been glorified in me. Right? So what he's trying to do, Paul, he's trying to assure them that God is with Jesus, and if Jesus is who, who they believe he is, then it's going to turn out okay. It may not look like it's going to turn out okay, but it will turn out all right. Amen. And so he's kind of preparing them, setting them up. Jesus has a way of doing that, folks. Right? The disciples had no earthly idea what was about to take place, had no idea what, was, what, what they were going to face in the future, and had no earthly idea, you know, that they were going to be, you know, challenged in their thinking and their theology and their lifestyle. And everything of who they were, were, were was going to be challenged. Does that sound kind of familiar to us? Right? That, 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 that's life. It happens to us on a daily basis, if you will. Things show up, things come up in life, and, and we are challenged. We were at, we are challenged in our in the changes that we have to make. We are challenged in every aspect of life. If we'll, I'm here to tell you this morning that God has a plan. And someone say amen with me. You agree with me. Amen. And, and you may agree hesitantly, but he has a plan. <laughs> it may not feel like like it's the good, the greatest plan, a good plan, but I'm here to assure you that God has a plan. And if you and I can just, you know, allow God to be God, it's going to be okay. There's something that God calls the disciples to, and he calls them to the world. In this setting, God, it's an interesting setting because uh, it, it, it's also known as a farewell discourse. Uh, that God goes on through uh, one chapter, chapter 7, 14, verse 1 through 17, and then uh, 26. Uh, and, and here, Jesus talks to the disciples concerning the Holy Spirit. He talks to them about, you know, he'll send the Holy Spirit. He says, where I go, you cannot come, as I told the Jews. But I will send to you a comforter. The Greek word for comforter, the Holy Spirit, in this sense, is, is parakletos. The word parakletos is uh, one who is called alongside that will not leave you nor forsake you, no matter what. And that's why we find Jesus making those kind of statements, I will not leave you nor forsake you until the end of this age, right? And so that's what, he's, that's, that's what this whole thing is taking place. God is, Jesus is trying to instill in them what's about to take place and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work in a person's life, right? And he, there in this whole process, you know, uh, concerning the advocate, concerning this parakletos, uh, this definition is amazing when you think about it. Right, because all too often you and I may feel alone. We may feel lonely in our in our journey. There are moments when life becomes very challenging, and obviously we do feel alone. That's just part of what happens in life. But let me remind you that the Holy Spirit is with you, St. Matthew. Let me remind you that wherever you're at and whatever you've been through, wherever you know uh, life takes you, that the Holy Spirit is with you. Continue to hold on to God, continue to seek after his presence, continue to continue to hold on to his hand through prayer and all that you can and rest assured that God will continue to help you and be with you as he will with all of us. The word parakletos, the definition, one called alongside that will not leave you nor forsake you. Uh, Jenny, it's like an attorney, right? And I often wonder about this sometimes. If they know that a person's guilty, boy, they get up and argue on their behalf like they're not. Right? I don't, you know, thought about that, and I'm not going to get into no discussion 
how, you know, what they must go through, what life may, you know, what goes on through the thought process afterwards, what have you. But, you know, they get up there and I'm watching them and I'm like, how in the world, if you know this guy, this person is guilty, how in the world do you get up there and argue on their behalf and try to prove that they're not guilty? I mean, <laughs> think about it. You know, it's a tough thing to do. But Heraclitus, Holy Spirit, advocate, the comforter that Jesus talks about that he's going to sing back here in John, is it does exactly that. He knows that we're guilty. And someone's saying, <laughs> every one of us are guilty at some point or another of things that, that are not right. Our lives sometimes are pretty messed up. Someone say amen with me. That's a small group, so we should be we should be able to engage in this thing a little easier this, this evening. I thought about it, and this is going to be great. Bible study, great preaching this evening, this morning. We, we are guilty, whether we realize it or not. You know, and, and the Holy Spirit uh, is alongside of every one of us, and He will not leave us, even though He knows that we're guilty. Right? That's the kind of advocate that Jesus was talking about. That He tells the disciples He's going to sing back to them, right? and He's going to give to us as well. This, this advocate that will not leave us, this advocate that will argue on our behalf, this advocate that will go and represent us, if you will. Another definition for Heraclitus is one that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, when you think about those soldiers and the military that have been out and seen you know, battle, they've seen the, the firefight, they've seen the bombs explode, they've seen the lives destroyed and people's lives literally you know, torn apart. They've seen it all. You know, but when they're there, it, is, it has been said, maybe that the last thing they think about when they're in the middle of a firefight is their wife or their children or their parents or back home. That's the last thing on their mind when they're there in the middle of the heat in the middle of this firefight. The only thing they have in mind is to protect and save their friend that fights alongside them. That is the definition of Paracleto as the Holy Spirit. He will not leave you in the middle of the firefight. He is with you. He, and here with the disciples, he's He's already started to prepare them. Right? It's interesting uh, what takes place there. Right? And, and he goes on and tells them, uh, little children, he uh, addresses them as little children. One of the, the few places where he does that, he understands what's about to take place. And he, he, he speaks to them with his compassion. Little children, uh, with you only a little while longer, you'll look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I'll say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. And then he goes on to say, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Now understand, church, that loving a person and loving one another doesn't mean that it's a, it's a license to get away with things. Uh, because we misconstrue our definition specifically you know, in our society, even our society around us, holds on to this, this basic understanding of love, right? And it's misconstrued to a certain degree, if you will, to a certain degree, but they understand the definition, right? But because we love one another, it doesn't mean that it's a license to get away with what we're not supposed to do. So justice is mixed there with love as well. It's like Richard, uh, when, when, uh, when a child, you know, at school or what have you, uh, probably acting up or doing something not responsive, but you care for that child, but you have to take some kind of action to discipline that child. Otherwise, that child will continue doing the same thing. And it will probably more likely mess things up for his or her life in the future. Someone has to say something, you know, if not a parent. It's the same kind of love that Jesus was talking about. It's this love that, that although there's compassion, there is there is this uh, there's peace about it. There is this softness about it. There's this tenderness about it. There is also in the midst of all that, a right, line to be drawn for all to know that just because he loves us doesn't mean that we can get away with anything and everything. Uh, he doesn't. He's not. He's not saying I don't love you. Rather, he'll discipline us some way or another, or he'll inform us. He'll teach us when our people was little, our oldest, uh, a 
kind of part I have no parenting skills. And who does have parenting skills? And you know, think about that. You know, it's like no one ever wrote a book on how to be a perfect parent. You know, the only way that that takes place is when when you've been around it for quite some time and you've done it. You know, you know, you've been around kids, but I mean, whether you're an aunt, uncle, or some loved one other than a parent, right? And, and so I thought there's certain things I want to do with him and my kids that I did, you know, that were, were done with me that I wanted to do different. Right, so with him, it was like, okay, we go, well, count to three, right? One, and don't let me get to three, right? And this is, by the way, as I'm counting to three, uh, this is your third strike. I've already talked to you about three times concerning don't do this, right? And so it's interesting because Rico was real slick when he was a little, little bit toddler, and one day he was hungry. Uh, uh, he was real hungry, and, uh, uh, and Phil, uh, he asked the adults, they're making some breakfast. They were cooking breakfast already, but he was, and all of a sudden I heard one, two, three. <laughs> you know, he started to count on me. <laughs> right? He understood the concept. Don't let me get the three or because we're going to take care of business. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this, this, this love that Jesus is talking about, it's an unconditional love that you can love somebody. How do you love someone that is unlovable for that matter as well? Unconditionally, how do you how do you do this? The world can't can't do this. The people who don't don't know Christ as their personal savior have a difficult time doing this. Why? Because we see it all too often. When someone is offended, when somebody's being uh, uh, offended against or hurt, what do they do? They retaliate. That's part of what this world around us does. You and I as Christians are not called to do that. You and I as Christians are called to do something totally different. And it's a difficult thing to do when you think about it, because I've often thought about it, and also married with myself, I struggle with it. How do you turn the cheek? How do you love your enemy? And Jesus gives, you know, another commandment, love one another. He's not just saying love your enemy, love one another. Right? How do you do this? Well, the only way that you and I can do this is through the Holy Spirit. The only way you and I can love someone who's unlovable is through the Holy Spirit. The only way you and I can fulfill God's commandment to love one another is through the Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit present and act in actions with us as well, church. Amen. We cannot be a church that doesn't know God through the Holy Spirit. I would invite you, if you don't know God in that form, I would invite you to seek after him in prayer. God, give me the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill me with your presence. Fill me with your breath. Let me see things as you see them. Don't let me try to bring you down to my point of view so that you may see things the way I see them because we do that all too often. Even when we pray for someone, we're praying and we want God to come down to our point of view versus you and I going up to his point of view. That's the difference, church. And Jesus is preparing the disciples and and, uh, God give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. This is... powerful here when you think about it because Jesus is about to give us life not only for the disciples but for the world. Are you and I capable of doing that? Man, that, that's right. That's right. I, mean, I don't know. And, and, and I would hope that you would think about it carefully and not answer too quickly. I don't know. I've often thought about it, Richard. I've thought about it for the years that I've been pastoring. I love God and I love God's people. Richard and I have talked this morning. And I mentioned to him, I love St. Matthew. I love you, church. I love you with God's love. What does that entail? I've often thought about, Mary, if someone walks into our church and attempts to assault someone else or our church members, pulls out a gun, what would I do? Think about it all the time. Would I hide behind this pulpit? Would I run out this building? Or would I give my life to what I believe in? I thought about it for many years. And I pray it never comes to that. But I've often thought about it. This is, is this something that I would do that I'll call through? And right off the bat, I, as I thought about it throughout the years, uh, there really is no more thought anymore concerning it. I believe I probably truly would. If 
because this is what this is what God calls us to. This is what I'm saying to you. This is what He calls us to to love one another with this unconditional love. How do we do that? How does something like that happen? Well, I would freely give my life to my family, and I gather you would too. But would you give your life to someone else? And Jesus tells him here, just as I have loved you, you are to love me. And that love is a profound because Jesus died for the disciples, he died for you and I for the world. That's the kind of love that Jesus had. He believed in what he stood on. Church, the difference is, is for many of our churches and many of our church members, and we cut across the, the globe, if you will, in different denominations, is that it's been said that they're not real sure if the church really loves the way they say they love. Most of you from the Gandhi story, when he came to the United States, he was educated here in the United States. And he turned from, from his religious beliefs, and he started attending a Bible church. And he started to grow in his faith, and he started to love God and love God's people. Upon graduating, he returned back to India his place of origin. And he returned back to his religion. And someone once asked him, what happened? And his reply was, I can't seem to understand how people that say they serve a loving God cannot love one another. Cannot love one another. It's not what we believe in. It is. If, if, do you and I believe in what we stand on? Do we truly believe in this God? And how far are we willing? Now, it doesn't mean that God will, will take us there, but how far are you and I willing to go in this life? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not preaching something that takes us out of what is right. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be this place. The pastor told us that, you know, that we ought to die for Jesus. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. But how much do you truly love God? We know that he loves us. And someone say amen with you. Thank God for that. But I'm preaching to a group of folks that are being called to a different level in their faith and their relationship with Christ. I'm not speaking, I gather this morning to, to beginners in the church and the faith. Rather, I'm trying to encourage you to continue to allow God in your life. The only way that we can truly do that, man, is if God is present in our lives. Other than that, we cannot fulfill even this basic command of life. It's too easy to love those that love us. But what about continuing sharing these good news with those that are unlovable and called to do that in the air? Listen to a couple of illustrations that are like. Ernest Hayman, in Bits and Pieces, writes, you can see them alongside the shuffleboard courts in Florida or on the porches of the old folks' homes up north. An old man with snow white hair, a little hard of hearing, reading the newspaper through a magnifying glass. An old woman in a shapeless dress, her knuckles gnarled like arthritis, wearing sandals to ease her aching arches. They are holding hands, and in a little while they will totter off to take a nap. And then she will cook supper, not a very good supper, and they will watch television, each knowing exactly what the other's thinking until it is time for dinner. They may even have a good soul-stirring argument just to prove that they still really care. And through the night, they will snore unbashedly, right? each resting content because the other is there. They are in love. They have always been in love. Although sometimes they would have denied it, and because they have been loved, they have survived everything that life would throw at them, even their own failures. So I thought about this 
for the illustration of the story. I couldn't help but to wonder how God's presence works in the midst of us when we allow Him. That even in our failures, we can rest sure that because of that love, because of that love, you and I can continue on forward. We continue doing what He calls us to do. The main basic command that we love one another. That's the greatest command, love. If we have not loved, what does Scripture say? Comes as a symbol that is kind and, and, and the kind goes away. It's not real. It's not real. True love stands the test of time. True love gets us even when we fail one another. True love keeps us together. Can someone say amen with me? True love keeps us standing strong, keeps us confident in who God is and who we are as a community. Can someone say amen with me? True love right, keeps us confident in who God is in our lives. This is an interesting one. It's called a love letter lament. It says, Dear, dear Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart, so please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yours forever. Marie. P.S. And congratulations on winning the state lottery. <laughs> uh, right. That's not real love, if you will. That's got some conditions behind it. You can hear it right off the bat. Another writer states, what is love? It is silence when words are hurt. It is patience when your anger is hurt. It is deafness when a scandal flows. It is thoughtfulness for others' woes. It is promise when stern duty calls. And it is courage when misfortune falls. That's what love is in community. That's what love is in church. All those things and more. The only way is you and I can continue on with this love is with God's holy presence in the midst of our lives. If you don't know God that way, I would invite you to find him that way. After all, isn't that our prayer and isn't that our, our call you know, when we read the Apostles' Creed? I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And if so, chase after God. Chase after God. Chase after his presence first. So I promise you. You'll never be the same again. And although God has been good, can someone say amen with me? Although God has kept us and held us, and, and we've seen some great things, and we've seen some misfortunes, we've seen some tough days. God, the great things or tough things that we've seen, God has been good. And He continues to hold on to us. Hold on to Him. Seek after Him. Hold on love Him. Desire Him. I desire more of God, church. I hope you do too. I'm not, I'm, I'm not content for God. I want more. You want more? Are you with me? Yeah. I want more. I'm going to get lost in worship sometimes. Do you want to get lost in worship sometimes? You know, as I conclude my sermon, when I was chasing Sister Sandy, I, I'd do anything I had to do to go and see her one more time. And when we talked on the phone, of course, we didn't have cell phones back then. And some of you may remember this. <coughs> Uh, we came and home, we had those phones that had that long cord. <laughs> and they were long enough, you know, because we bought, you know, the, the extended version, right, where you can lay down in bed and talk, right, you know, go around the corner to the other room. And I would talk to Sandy till I'd fall asleep. And all of a sudden she said, are you, I remember her saying, are you asleep? I said, oh, no, 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 I was just kind of, I was kind of just taking a deep breath. <laughs> Randy, I think I was snoring as well as going <laughs> But I couldn't get enough of her voice. I, I wanted to see her every day. You know, my car broke down and I would walk blocks and blocks and probably miles to get to her to see her. You know. Those of you that remember the 80s, you know, you wear your, your straight-legged jeans and your in your in your Nike, you know, high tops. You know, I I'd be looking stupid when I show up, Mary. 
I'm sure be all praise my hair or that head the head hair back then. My hair was done like you can't even imagine. My shoes were looking white and, and boy, I just I'm bragging on myself. But when I get home that night, I'd have to pull out the pebbles from underneath the plantation where I wore them out walking to go see her. But I'm trying to tell you, church, is that same way that you and I sometimes go after those relationships, go after a relationship with God the same way. Fall in love with him. Because I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. And whatever difficult moments lie ahead, it is God's love and his love in the midst of us that will carry us through. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.